What's up, sons? It's Blydrod with Sound of Attack once again, and today we are going to answer the question, WTF is Cardano? But before we get into it, here's a word from our sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people alike on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and even cryptocurrency. As a content creator and cryptocurrency enthusiast, Skillshare offers me the tools to sharpen my videography skills with classes like Video on a Budget, Prepare for Your Shoot Without Breaking the Bank, and for cryptocurrency, Accounting 101, Accounting Rules for Crypto and Bitcoin. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they are always launching new premium classes. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Welcome back. So I'm super excited to always have Skillshare as a sponsor once a week. So definitely click that link and make sure you get signed up within the first 1000 to of course get some free time. Now Cardano is an interesting one because it's another one that is getting pumped a lot. A lot of people want to talk it up. A lot of people hope for it to obviously go up in price and a lot of people are super excited about it. So hopefully what we're gonna go over is the technical details that will explain to you why you may be interested in it and how it functions. This series primarily covers the technical aspects of the coin at a very basic level. So you can start to get an idea of what it's supposed to be doing and then start monitoring and see if they actually do it. So first of all, is it an application coin or a currency coin? So a smart contract coin, that sort of thing goes into application coins. That would be something like Ethereum or Polkadot, etc. While a currency would be something like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Vertcoin, etc. So it's important that you guys understand the differences between these two because they function differently just at the very base. While the tokens on an application coin can of course be used as currency, that's not their primary focus. Their primary focus is to deploy smart contracts and applications on the blockchain. So next we need to talk about scalability. The big one that everybody is trying to solve is scalability on the blockchain. ETH has not gotten there yet because there's still proof of work with a single chain. And because of that, they are going to be trying to move to proof of stake and enabling shards so that they can have multiple shards. I think the limit's still gonna be like 64 though, and then be able to basically scale that process out. In the case of Cardano as it sits, it does not currently solve scalability. As much as the rhetoric would like to make you think it does, they are currently at the same stage as ETH, however, using proof of stake and not proof of work. So while they are already set up for proof of stake to move into scalability, they have not done it. What is their plan for scalability? Well, that's what they're gonna call quorums. Basically, think of quorums as shards for Cardano or of course in the case of something like Polkadot, then that one would be parachains and para threads. The only coins that have really, in, that I have reviewed recently that have solved scalability has been Conflux and of course Polkadot. Outside of those two, which have multi-chain kind of functionality in general, there are none others that I have found quite yet. I would like to learn of more, so let me know in the comment section below. It's important to note that Cardano has not done this yet. It's on the roadmap, but it is not currently in place, meaning no, they have not solved this problem yet. Now for backend development, this is gonna be important. Plutus is going to be the programming language. That programming language is based on Haskell. Now it's, you need to be clear and understand that you aren't gonna be programming in Haskell necessarily. You'll be programming in Plutus, which is based on Haskell. So if you're familiar with Haskell, you should be good to go. That being said, it is a fairly complicated programming language with a large learning curve due to its mathematics. However, from what I hear, it's straight to the point because of those mathematics. Putting it basically 
in a land of its own for programming languages outside of both Polkadot and of course Ethereum who use different programming languages and you can check out those videos if you're interested in that. What does that mean? That means all of these can exist together. Coexistence, my friends. There's no reason to say Cardano versus DOT or DOT versus Ethereum. You guys need to understand once you start getting into the technical details, there's a place for everything. The execution environment is K EVMs, and yes, that EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine copied over, adding in that K. So it is different, it does function different, but it is still based on EVM, meaning that you should be able to migrate, like we've talked about with other coins like Tron, pretty easily from, of course, Ethereum virtual machines to, I suppose, Cardano virtual machines. Now, governance is yet another thing that we always try to talk about. For Ethereum, they're EIPs. For, of course, Cardano, they're going to be CIPs, Cardano Improvement Proposals. Now, they do add an additional one here called FPs, which are funding proposals, and they use both of those together to allow the future of Cardano to be determined by its community and funded from the platform's treasury. So you want to take all of this into account, but it is going to be a democratic thing from my understanding, and that is how they are handling governance. If you need to keep up to date, the best thing to do is gonna be Googling different CIPs and seeing how they are playing out for voting. Now the consensus mechanism is Ouroboros proof of stake. Now thanks to Ouroboros, that will in theory go ahead and enable their quorums later on. So the proof of stake portion of this is going to, in theory, enable them to implement the scalability solution easier. But we need to talk about fees next. Initially, early on, all the fees were run by nodes that were burning all of the fees. Now, this obviously has an effect on supply and stuff early on, and then that moved on. This is also why you didn't see like a huge spike necessarily in price just due to them moving on to paying out fees to stakeholders. Now we've talked about proof of stake before. If we need to do a dumbed down version and just what is proof of stake, let me know. But there are a lot of different types of proof of stake, so it can get a little confusing. In this type, the fees are handled as such, A plus B times S where A and B are constants and S is the size of the transaction. So by, in bytes, by the way. Now, the reason for having parameter A is the prevention of DDoS attacks. Even a very small dummy transaction should cost enough to hurt an attacker who tries to generate many thousands of them. Parameter B has been introduced to reflect actual costs. Storing larger transactions needs more computer memory than storing smaller transactions. So larger transactions should be more expensive than smaller ones, hence why you have that B. There you go. So their fees actually function in a way that has enabled them to have faster transaction times than ETH. However, that, that is yet to be fully determined. That is claimed, right? And you need to keep in mind, every time we talk about Ethereum and faster transactions on other networks, you need to take into account the absolute amount of transactions that are on Ethereum compared to other ones. Seeing that this one and Tron as well, even though Tron is faster as well, both of them don't have near as many transactions as Ethereum, and neither one of these, Tron or Cardano, has actually completed solving scalability issues. And that's kind of where I end this today. What do I think of Cardano? It is currently a hype coin, unfortunately, in my humble opinion, that is based around using the scientific peer-reviewed kind of policies to build the blockchain that is supposed to be more scalable and safer and faster, all the stuff than ETH. And that's kind of where it aims itself at. Now they are able to, and I wanted to mention this, more recently, you can, they are now a multi-asset coin 
And to give you guys an idea of what that means is basically that is the equivalent of Ethereum moving to ERC-20 or deploying ERC-20 tokens on the network. That is now possible on Cardano, which is probably why you saw a price rise. Do I think it, that Cardano has promise? Yes, I do. Mainly based around, of course, the programming language as well as the execution environments. And if they can get scalability solved, then we're going to be good to go. Would I dare compare this or say it's an ETH killer? No. Would I say this is a Polkadot killer? No. Each single one does different things. What you're going to want to take a look at is the roadmap and see if they're ticking off all of the basically all of the check boxes on their roadmap with the most important one being deploying the quorums. If they can't get the quorums figured out and that is not deployed, then we will not have basically this up and running in a manner that is going to be able to scale at the level that it will need to, to basically deploy all the applications that we would want to then increase, of course, the price. Now, I did want to mention as well, almost forgot, you have staking pools and then allowing people to, you can delegate your staking rule or delegate your stake to a pool. And if you guys want to know how to stake Cardano, let me know in the comment section below. I'll work on it. You guys also have to realize it requires a lot of money just to do the how-tos that I do, especially when we start getting into staking and all of that. So financially, I'm not always able to do all of the how-tos. And in some cases, I have actually been pretty, uh, like that money just goes away depending on the success of the coin and at what time I did the how-to and if it went up or down in price. So it's a very a tricky thing to do, but I'm definitely willing to do it and I'm trying to, obviously. Part of that is doing the YouTube videos and trying to make the ad revenue off of it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next Tuesday. If you enjoyed this content, you can check out more crypto content on this playlist up here. Or, of course, go ahead and subscribe for more in the future. Adios.